Assalamualaikum. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Today, on the September 23rd, 2020, we are very fortunate to have a very special guest uh, for the 53rd Distinguished Lecture Series at UTM. So the Lecture Series or the Distinguished Lecture Series, DLS, is organized by the Faculty of Engineering, uh, University of Technology Malaysia. So our speaker today is Associate Professor, Dr. Chad Risco. Okay, Chad and I, um, we started our collaboration, I think it's exactly about a year ago. Okay, um, I was a um, uh, US uh, Fulbright scholar and I was attached to the Center of Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. So um, the professor, who is uh, Professor Mark Crocker, uh, he's also the Associate Director of CAER. So he suggested to me to learn about uh, density functional theory, about the computational methods. Um, so uh, he then uh, asked me that uh, he thinks that I should work with uh, Chad Risco, Dr. Chad Risco. And so I made contact with the Chad and um, I was very fortunate that he actually accepts me to be one of his students. Okay, so when I was there, uh, it was just very short time, just for three months. So it was a very interesting, um, uh, method, you know, the one that I learned, I use uh, the software VASP, but it was such a short time and I requested Sha that I think we should continue this collaboration after I uh, go back to UTM. So Sha was kind enough, so he was, he agrees to it and we are still continuing this collaboration. So my students and I are working on the project on the photocatalytic reaction, uh, but it's not that easy. So we thought that we could finish uh, within a few months, but this has been extending. Hopefully we will finish soon. Okay, so that's uh, my um, collaboration with Chad and Chad is a very nice man. Uh, his wife actually has a fraternity sister here in Malaysia. So that's quite a good connection, strong connection between uh, university, between Malaysia and uh, Kentucky. Okay, Chad, um, I think, um, I wish you all the best for this talk today and we're looking forward to your interesting presentation. Over to you, um, Datuk. Uh, thank you, Professor Nur Aisha, for chairing the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone, welcome to our 53rd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Chad Risco from University of Kentucky, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Chad Risco is an associate professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Kentucky. Chad received his PhD at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech, under the direction of Professor Jean-Luc Breda undertook postdoctoral research with professors Mark Ratner and Tobin Marks at Northwestern University and has been at the University of Kentucky since 2014. Chess research blends principles from organic and physical chemistry, condensed metaphysics and material science to develop theoretical materials chemistry approaches to better understand and design materials for advanced electronics and power generation and storage applications. Chad was named a 2016 Emerging Investigator by the Journal of Materials Chemistry by the Royal Society of Chemistry, received a 2018 Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, was selected as a 2018 Cotrail Scholar, Research Corporation for Science Advancement RCSA, and was an RCSA Silo Fellow for Advanced Energy Storage. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Chad Risco from University of Kentucky, USA, and uh, with a talk entitled From Molecules to Organic Semiconductors, The Challenges of Processing and Polymorphs from the Perspective 
of modeling. Professor Chedrisko, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Rafiq and, and, and Professor Aisha. Um, it really is an honor um, for me to be able to share some of our research with you today um, and, and continue really the, the wonderful relationship that we've developed um, over this last year since Professor Aisha um, first came to um, visit us at the University of Kentucky. So give me just one moment here as I prepare to share my screen. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, um, we can. You're, we're good? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, awesome. Well, fantastic. So again, here's the title. Um, and again, we are a, a computational materials chemistry group um, where, as Professor Rafiq introduced, we are interested in really trying to bridge understanding in chemistry and physics and in material science, even now a little bit in data science, um, to try to develop models of materials that are of interest for many different kinds of applications. Today, we're going to talk specifically about applications of, of organic semiconductors. Um, so to get started here, let me see. There we go. I do want to start with the, probably the most important slide, um, and that's the acknowledgments of, of all the people in the group um, that, that, you know, I'm, I'm just get to stand here and or sit here, I guess, today um, in front of you um, and, and tell you about the fantastic work that they do. So we've been very fortunate to have a number of really great postdoctoral researchers, as well as graduate and undergraduate researchers. And even more recently, some students from local high schools are coming into the lab and, um, and working with us. And so the, hopefully you can see the, the names that are highlighted in blue. And I will um, be talking about the work that they've done um, throughout today's talk. We're also very fortunate to have a number of, of fantastic collaborators from across um, the US here for the particular projects that I'm going to talk about. Um, and in particular, Professor Amasian from North Carolina State University, Professor Anthony from here at the University of Kentucky, Professor Bazan, who's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and also at National University in Singapore. Bhaskar Ganapatha Subramanian at Iowa State, Oanar Chuchescu at Wake Forest, and Yudlin Liu at Princeton University. And in particular, the research that I'll talk about today was funded by the National Science Foundation here in the United States, as well as our Office of Naval Research. And so to set the stage, the materials that we're going to talk about today are often referred to as plastic electronics. And you can see some of the applications that are either currently on the marketplace today, or people are still working in academic labs um, to, to make these applications reality. And so you can see down here in the bottom right-hand corner, this television display from LG, and also the, the Samsung telephones. Um, these are examples of um, semiconductor technologies referred to as organic light emitting diodes, where the semiconducting or light emitting material in these devices are principally derived from pi conjugated molecules or polymers. If you can make red, green, and blue pixels for full color display, well, you can also make white light. And so you see an example here in the middle of a, a very flexible um, organic light emitting diode that is um, producing white light. And so you can imagine the tremendous form factors that you can get in terms of new kinds of, of lighting um, if you're thinking about architectural design. In addition, there's been a, a few decades efforts now in trying to develop photovoltaic cells. And you, again, you can see um, this organic photovoltaic cell. Notice that both for the, the lighting application here and also for the solar cell, that these materials are flexible. This is one of the, the sort of key drivers of the field is are these mechanical properties that you can still keep in the material um, that are plastic-like, right? But yet you can still transport charge and, and get light out. And then finally, you see an example of a robotic hand from Takao Somea's group at the University of Tokyo, where if you can see these dark little spots that are on here, these are individual transistors that, again, are derived from organic semiconductors. 
So the organic semiconductors are still very interested, uh, still have a lot of interest in the academic circles, but they are already making um, a really nice push into commercial applications. So we're interested in, in, in really trying to understand how materials are derived from the bottom up. And so let's imagine that we have a particular application that we want and, and we need a, the material to have a particular kind of response. And so here's an example of a current versus voltage plot for an organic field effect transistor. And it just kind of gives you an idea of what a typical response curve might look like for that organic photovoltaic. Well, if we want to think about how these materials are built, we have to start at the beginning with the building blocks. And in these organic semiconductors, well, the molecules, they're the, the, the building blocks are organic molecules. They, they are pi conjugated, and it's the, it's the key features of the pi conjugation that allow us to design in the material the charge carrier transport characteristics. Now, it's one thing to have the building blocks, and organic chemists are really good at using synthetic organic chemistry to derive molecules that have very particular electronic and optical properties, but it's wholly another thing to predict how those individual molecules will pack in the solid state. This is the der deriving force behind the so-called crystal, crystal structure prediction paradigm that is of importance here in materials chemistry, but also in pharmaceuticals. And so the idea is, how do we understand the nature of the relatively weak non-covalent interactions that are gonna dictate the way that these molecules pack in the solid state? And here you can see I'm just representing these here by shapes that look like the old Tetris game um, for those of you of a certain age. But if we have structure prediction, right, if we can get to that point, well, we also need to be able to predict the properties of that material. Because if we have the properties, then eventually, hopefully, we can predict response. And so this is this kind of cycle that we need to think about. But there are many unknown questions, right, um, along the way. So let me tell you a little bit more about those individual Tetris blocks to give you an idea of some of the chemistry that goes into um, how they're designed. And so this is an example of a molecular system that we've studied quite extensively that was first synthesized by Guy Bazan, as I mentioned, who's at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And there are some key features in this organic molecule that are of interest. The first here is highlighted in blue. And this is the length and the dimension and the direction of the pi conjugated pathway. You can see that this system has a fairly extended pi conjugated path. For those with a little bit more of a physics background, you can think about tuning the electronic properties of this system by thinking about the particle in a box wave functions. Next, we have a lot of heteroatoms within the system. Chemists use these heteroatoms to modulate the electronic properties beyond what the, the pi conjugated backbone can do. And then finally, there are these um, sections of the molecule on the periphery that are highlighted in green. And these are fully saturated alkyl chains. And these alkyl chains are generally appended to the pi conjugated chromophores in order to induce solubility in common organic solvents. I'm gonna note at this point that these alkyl chains are electronically inert. They really don't do anything to the electronic and optical properties of the individual molecules themselves. Now, this is about the molecular features, but when we get to the solid state, one of the key differences between these organic semiconductors and a traditional inorganic semiconductor is that in, in, in a traditional inorganic semiconductor, all of the building blocks, in these cases atoms, are held together by covalent bonds. In these organic systems, however, we have weak non-covalent interactions that hold the molecules together in the solid. And because we have these weak non-covalent interactions, we, it's, it's much more difficult um, to control how they were gonna pack. And if we think about moving charge through a system, we need to worry about how well every individual molecule interacts electronically with its neighbors. We typically, to evaluate that, use a parameter referred to as the electronic coupling, which is simply a measure of the degree of the wave function overlap between two molecules. And here, this is denoted as, as with the capital V. This is some older work from 2002 from Jean-Luc's group. It's showing a very similar plot, just in two dimensions. 
But here, if we look on this right-hand side of this three-dimensional surface, right, we're plotting the electronic coupling as a function of taking two molecules and displacing one along the short axis and then also rotating it. And what you can see from the surface is that there are a large number of undulations and that these undulations are very big with very small movements. And this is one of the sort of key things that we try to get to understand in these systems is how can we make these molecules path? How can we design the molecules and also the processing conditions to try to get the materials to have the largest electronic couplings between the molecules? Because that's gonna be one of the key parameters to ensure good electron transport. Now about processing, in terms of a key feature of organic semiconductors is not only can they be vapor, de vapor deposited like many common inorganic semiconductors, but a lot of these materials are being developed so that they can be printed. You can think of these, these individual molecules, these individual building blocks as dyes that go into inks. And so you have to figure out how to make these different ink formulations. And so indeed, there's been a, quite a bit of research on trying to print organic semiconductors from inkjet printers, from blade printers, from spray coating, and even in advanced manufacturing. But when we think about these different printing paradigms, they each have their own chemical and physical problems that need to be addressed, including just even the nature of the chemistry of what makes up the ink. What is the host solvent and are there other additives? In addition, material scientists have introduced a, a large number of post-processing methods to try to improve film morphologies. And so these are gonna be things like applying a little heat, so thermal annealing, or maybe even floating some solvent vapor over the film in a process referred to as solvent vapor annealing. And you can see some of the impact here on this molecular core that's referred to as naphthalene diamond. And we're not gonna worry so much about the chemistry that goes on at either the X position or the R position here. Just know that there are four different and NTCDI molecules that are here. And if you just cast the film from its regular casting solvent, the grazing incidence wide angle X-ray scattering data show that they all take on the same polymorph. In this case, it was referred to as the beta phase. However, if you take that beta phase polymorph and solvent vapor anneal it, well, two of the molecules undergo a polymorphic transition. The phase changes in the solid state whereas two of the molecules do not. And we don't really quite understand yet why this happens in these cases. We do understand that there's probably some kinetic barriers um, that need to be overcome um, in order to undergo these polymorphic transformations, but we're still trying to work out some of the, the more intricate physical chemistry questions that might be at play there. So the, the motivation for today's talk really is this question, is that if we think about a given technology, what knowledge do I need to have to create an organic semiconductor for that application from scratch, okay? And again, we're computational chemists, we're physical chemists, we wanna to try to understand this from the bottom up, not only to help our synthetic colleagues um, design better materials, but also to try to take advantage now and in the near future of um, machine-based materials design paradigms. And so we're also, in addition, trying to just understand, you know, some attributes for the synthetic chemist, we're also trying to develop understanding to build models for such um, computer-aided design. And so with that, I wanna take you through a couple of, of, of questions. And the first one is, are these alkyl side chains that I pointed to really just there for solubility? And so, in this case, to, to start a story, um, and we're gonna be looking at molecule, molecules that have this similar kind of structure throughout. Um, we're gonna start with this molecule here that's on the left. It's referred to as pentacene. It's five fused benzene rings. And what we're doing is we're looking down the long axis of the crystal structure, and you can see that the pentacene crystal packs in what we refer to as the herringbone packing configuration. Well, almost 20 years ago now, my colleague at the University of Kentucky, Professor John Anthony, was trying to make a red emitter for organic light emitting diodes. And pentacene is notoriously insoluble in common organic solvents. And so what he did was he put these big bulky side groups on here, referred to as 
try isopropyl. So there's three isopropyl groups, silyl, ethyl groups. Okay, and you see that they're appended here at the nine and 10 positions. And what Professor Anthony found when he did this is that he completely changed the crystal packing of the structure. We went from the herringbone packing configuration from pentacene to this brickwork, what's referred to as the brickwork packing configuration for tips pentacene. We refer to this molecule as tips pentacene, and the tips again is for the triisopropyl silo. So, Professor Anthony and, and his a number of his graduate students went and tried to synthesize a large number of these systems and then also evaluate their crystal structures with a really fantastic crystallographer that we have at the University of Kentucky by the name of Sean Parkin. Um, and what they found was that they could look at the geometry of the molecule to try to make predictions of what the crystal packing would look like. And again, this is purely empirical at this point. Um, and you see the date here is 2002. And what they found was that if you evaluated the length of the pi conjugated chromophore here, which we've labeled as B for this parallel pipette shape, and you compared that to assuming that the triisopropyl um, structure makes a spherical like shape, it's really an ellipsoid and just a sphere is a special case of an ellipse. Um, if you look at the diameter of that sphere, and compare the two. So the direct comparison here is the length of the pi conjugated backbone of the long axis has to be approximately two times the diameter of this sphere. Empirically, what they found was that molecules that had that molecular structure would lead to this brickwork um, structure that I showed you on the previous slide. And again, empirically, materials that pack in this configuration in the bulk crystal tend to form really nice semi-crystalline films that perform well in field effect transistors. So let's look at another system because again, we wanted to dig into a little bit of the physical chemistry here. And so here is again, tips pentacene. There's that brickwork packing configuration. And I've labeled here for you that now the radius, not the diameter, but the radius of the sphere measured from the center of the silicon to one of the hydrogen atoms that sits out on the methyl group here. And you see for tips pentacene, it's about 3.9 in, in a gas phase DFT calculation. You see the level of theory is there. Um, and in the crystal, it's a little bit more compact at about 3.7. Well, here's another molecular structure. It's referred to as tri triethyl silo. Why ethyl? Because we now have three ethyl groups instead of the isopropyl. We get the ethyl groups because we just take one of the methyls off of the isopropyl and replace it with the hydrogen atom. See that the radius um, computed by DFT or in the crystal, essentially identical, right? But the bulk crystal packing for this molecule is referred to as slip stack. Now the slip stack configuration does lead to molecular systems that show large overlap of these pi conjugated backbones. That's gonna be really good for um, inducing materials that have at least pretty decent electronic couplings. Again, that parameter that we're, one of those parameters that we look for in initial evaluations as to whether or not a material may potentially be good for charge carrier transport. The problem is, is that it's been found that material molecules that pack in the slip stack configuration lead to more needle-like structures. And so if you're trying to make a transistor, um, the needle-like structures actually lead you to um, materials that just don't work very well at all. Again, and, and this is all empirical observation at this point. So we started to try to understand at the molecular level, what was going on? What is leading to these differences? And I'm gonna kind of skip over some of the molecular story to go more to a little bit of the understanding that we've developed in terms of the, um, the bulk packing. Um, and one of the ways that we did this was through what we referred to sort of tongue in cheek as creating in silico polymorphs. So we know that tips pentacene again packs in this brickwork configuration, whereas test pentacene packs in the slip stack configuration. And these were at the time, the only two crystal structures that we knew for these two materials. So what we wanted to do in the computer, right, was just to switch them to say, hey, what would happen if test pentacene could be forced, you know, through processing to pack like a brickwork configuration 
and tips pentacene could be forced to back in a slip stack configuration. And the first time that I presented this in about 2016 or so at a conference, my colleague, Oana Trichescu, who's at Wake Forest University, and I have the timestamp on the email, sent me an email in the middle of my talk and said, we just reported a paper on a material that does exactly that. And the, the molecular material is, the molecule is down here. It's a dibenzo coronine. Again, and you see these trialkyl silo groups here. And in these cases, these are trimethyl silos. And what they found was that if they controlled the temperature, either the temperature of the, the processing solution or the temperature of the substrate, they could get this molecule to pack in either a slip stack configuration or a brickwork configuration. And you see that the charge carrier mobilities that were extracted from field effect transistor measurements are drastically different. When you get this brickwork, you get this nice plate-like crystal, you get a charge carrier mobility for holes of about 2.1 centimeter squared per volt second. Whereas for the one dimensional slip stack, it might be a little bit hard to see here because the resolution is not great. That's more of a needle-like morphology. And you see that the charge carrier mobility is two orders of magnitude smaller. Okay, so this, this gave us some confidence, right, that our maybe wild idea of, of creating these in silico polymorphs um, might, you know, not be such a bad thing. And so one of the things that we wanted to start to, to understand was the cohesive energy density. Because the cohesive energy density of the molecule in these different packing configurations will give you an idea of the relative stability of the molecule in that, in that packing configuration. And so as we see for the triethyl silo that pre preferentially packs in the slip stack configuration, it has a larger cohesive energy density than the brickwork. But the differences in these energies isn't, isn't too big. Um, tips pentacene, larger cohesive energy in the brickwork versus slip stack. Again, this is the known ground state polymorph. For the dibenzocoronine, it actually has a pretty significantly larger um, cohesive energy density in the slip stack configuration um, versus the brickwork. So it would suggest that the ground state or the, the most favorably energetically polymorph for the TMSDBC is the slip stack configuration. And it's through that temperature control, right? Through those higher temperatures that they could actually get to this less stable polymorph, but it's this less stable polymorph that leads to the much better performance in the field effect transistor. So we can also use periodic density functional theory calculations then to evaluate the potential electronic properties of these materials in these different packing configurations. Indeed, if we look at things like the valence band dispersion or the effective mass for holes, because these are gonna be materials that preferentially transport holes versus electrons. We see that for the test pentacene, it really doesn't matter if it's in the slip stack or the brickwork configuration. The effective masses are fairly small um, and the valence bands are fairly dispersed. For tips pentacene though, there is a dramatic change if you try to take tips pentacene and put it in the slip stack while the valence band dispersion is essentially flat and the effective mass gets very large very quickly. For TMS-DBC, again, the electronic properties don't seem to um, change all that much in the two different packing configurations, very much like test pentacy. We still haven't been able to um, figure out a processing method to get test pentacene into brickwork. There are some signatures from a collaborator, Lin Liu, that suggest that maybe it can form that, but we've not been able to quite yet um, fully identify yet, that yet. So that's still a work in progress. But let me introduce you to another molecule, and we refer to this as Tipka pentacene. And the only difference between Tipka and Tips pentacene is the fact that we replaced the silicon in Tips pentacene with germanium. Notice that the radii are a little bit different, and that's consistent with the fact that germanium, again, is a little bit bigger of an atom than silicon. But the ground state polymorph for Tipka pentacene is herring bone. It's completely different than what I've shown you already. And it's a two atom difference going from Tips to Tipka. That's, the, that's it in terms of the change of the building block. It's a pretty small change to lead to a very dramatic change in the, the way that that molecular material packs. Unfortunately, these herringbone packed materials, at least in this kind of herringbone packing, um, lead to very flat valence and conduction bands. 
So tipgapentacine, which the bands are shown in red, tipspentacine, if we put it in this configuration, neither of them would be, we would predict to be very good for charge carrier transport materials. However, if we could get tipgapentacine into the brickwork configuration, it should look very similar to tipspentacine in terms of its band dispersion and effective masses. Now we found that the differences in the cohesive energy densities for the tipgapentacine on going from this herringbone structure to the, to the brickwork were quite small. And this spurred um, our colleague, Professor Anthony, to take a look at this molecule and see if they could change the processing conditions to um, try to grow the brickwork polymorph. And indeed, we now have a molecular system that is this tipgapentacine that has a crystal structure, a known crystal structure, that's the herringbone, a known crystal structure, that's the slip stack, as well as a known crystal structure, that's the brickwork. And so this is really powerful, right, for us if we want to start to better understand um, these kinds of materials and, and what it is about the subtleties in these chemistries of the molecules themselves, but also the processing conditions, as we'll see in just a moment, that um, will lead to some differences. So one thing that I want to, to leave you with here is just another question. And as I said, there's a, a big push in terms of crystal structure prediction. And one of the questions that I have is that as it becomes more feasible to do crystal structure prediction, is it really enough to be able to predict just the low energy solid state structure? Or do we need to not only consider that the different structures, but also, again, that property relationship that leads to a particular response? So now let's go to processing a little bit, see how we can use simulations there to see if we can understand how mater these materials might nucleate and grow. And so with that here, this is a collaboration with, with Arama Masian and Professor Amasian at, at North Carolina State University um, is using a blade coating technique to um, deposit this like material that we just have been talking about, but you might notice that the pi conjugated backbone is a little bit different than what was before. And from the experimental perspective, one of the interesting things here is that if they control the temperature, again, of, of the processing, and it's about 70 degrees C, see here, so it's not very high temperature, um, and also the speed at which the blade moves. You see that there's a front back here where there are small crystallites that are growing, but then there's this region where you, they've noticed that it's a very dense, low solvent, high semiconductor, very amorphous system. And what they found is that when they get this amorphous structure to a point where it's about 90% by volume, the organic semiconductor, they can grow beautiful semi-crystalline films that lead to charge carrier mobilities that are about three times bigger than if they, they don't control the temperature and the blade coating as well, the blade speed as well. So here we've been simulating um, these molecular systems in toluene, again, toluene is the processing solvent. We've now turned to molecular dynamic simulations in this case. So we've moved away from our, our density functional theory calculations. And you can see here, we've removed the, the solvent just for clarity, but you can see that we start, if we start from very random configurations of the molecules in toluene, and this is 90% by weight, um, after a short period, of the molecular dynamic simulation, you can see that we start to form these sort of one dimensional um, like patterns that are reminiscent of that slip stack structure that I've mentioned already. After another short period of time, some of those one dimensional slip stacks start to turn into brick -like, brickwork like configurations that just continue to build in as we allow the simulation to run for longer and longer periods of time. And so here we stopped this particular simulation at 100 nanoseconds, not too long, but long enough, right, to be able to watch the nucleation and growth of these molecular systems, right, in, in, the, in the conditions that are consistent with that processing. Um, if we go to a, a slightly smaller um, weight percent, we've run these actually for much longer. 
And again, what we're seeing here is one of the things about the simulations, the way that we have set them up, is that we are simulating both the air interface that the solution will it has in the blade coating experiment, but also the interface with the underlying dielectric, which in this case is silicon dioxide. And what we see is that the molecules that sit on the top tend to form much better and much more ordered structure than the uh, molecules that sit down by that silicon dioxide interface. And in fact, as we carry this forward, and we've carried this actually forward much further now, we can see the structure continue to build in and build in and build in. And this gives you an idea that the variations in the interfaces that the solution um, is in contact with um, plays a key role. Now, one thing I will point out is that you see that there's a lot of order up here in this blue structure, right, where we see a lot of this brickwork like packing configuration. There's some over here, but there's this region of disorder. Again, down here for the, for the bottom layer, some regions of order, but quite a bit of disorder. Well, those regions of disorder are where the solvents are being pushed. And for lack of a better term, this is, this is looking very much like the formation of grain boundaries in this system. Um, we are currently working to develop MD simulations following this pathway, but where after some time we start to remove these toluene molecules, trying to um, simulate better the actual evaporation process that should occur during the processing. Finally, I will note that concentration in the simulations does play a key role. And you can see that as we increase the concentration of the organic semiconductor, um, here all of these simulations were stopped after I think 100 or 150 nanoseconds, you can see that the degree of order increases pretty dramatically as we, we increase the um, number of molecules in these solutions. And this, is, this can be enumerated by looking at some natural order parameters. Here the Q00 is the order of, the relative order of the long axis of those pi conjugated backbones that I pointed to, whereas the red is the short axis. And you can see that when we reach about a 70% by weight solution is when we start to see the, the largest um, order um, in these structures. And, and that is consistent with the, um, with the experimental um, measurements. Again, we've got some work to do here, but I think that this is really promising because it's showing that we can take into account um, a number of the characteristics or parameters that can be controlled in experiment and, and start to really provide an atomistic picture of how these materials may, may form. So finally, um, like a lot of people in, in, in materials chemistry and material science, um, we are quite interested in using um, data science and data analytics, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence to help build computer-aided design models. And so what we've been doing through the context of a, of a grant from the National Science Foundation is to build a database um, that we refer to as Ocelot, so just like the cat. Um, here, Ocelot stands for Organic Crystals in Electronic and Light-Oriented Technologies. Um, I invite you to go and visit the website, and you'll see the website um, address on the bottom of the screen. I will note that that is version essentially 0 0.01 of the, um, of the database. Um, we are currently expanding that, and I'll, and I'll show you how we're expanding that here. And it's going to have a lot more utility, hopefully, in the next maybe three or four months when the, when the new version becomes public. But what we're doing here is we're starting with some experimental information, starting with molecular or crystal structure. We've set up a high-throughput computational workflow where we're primarily evaluating electronic properties, but we also have the capabilities of evaluating optical properties as well. And as we're developing all of this data, we're taking the experimental data and the computational data and developing descriptor schema. And that's what we're putting into Ocelot as a database um, that is gonna be open to the public. So this database we're building within the principle that's referred to as FAIR, which means that the data is gonna be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We are modular modularizing our data. Um, we are breaking the, the systems down into the crystal structure and their properties. 
the molecule and its properties, but then also trying to break down the molecules into these different components like the pi conjugated backbone or the alkyl side chains. With the idea that if we can have all of these different descriptors, right, we might be able to define um, correlations that will help us lead to um, improved packing models. And again, the data that we develop will be machine accessible so that we can enable community-based um, machine learning um, algorithms. Um, we've developed an API, and you can see some of the, the things that have, got, that have gone into the API, including the high-throughput um, workflow, data curation, and access. We're currently under a, a pretty heavy lifting in terms of the computations that we're undertaking. Um, we have um, extracted about 56,000 structures from the Cambridge Structural Database, as well as some unpublished crystal structures from some of our um, synthetic colleagues, and, and have started to, to build a database based on those tens of thousands of structures. Now, we don't want to do density functional theory calculations on all of those, and so we've, we have made some choices in, in, in terms of trying to down-select um, to those kinds of materials that might have characteristics that would be good for organic semiconductors. And so right now, we've gone from about 56,000 structures to about 25,000 structures. And we hope, again, maybe in the next three months or so that we'll finish the calculations and be able to, to really start to, one, I'll have this really huge data set available to the community, um, but also start our own um, machine learning um, on that data. But it's not just machine learning and, and you know, some of the, let's say, fancier data analytics techniques that can be applied to this data. And I just want to just end with one quick story. And this is a story of materials rediscovery. And so you see these two molecules that are on the, on the screen. Um, they look very similar at first glance. And I will tell you that they only differ by four hydrogen atoms. And the four hydrogen atoms are the two hydrogen atoms here and two hydrogen atoms here are removed to take this from this ethyl group to this ethyne, okay? And based on visual inspection of the crystal structure some, a number of years ago, um, the molecule on the left was chosen to move forward with um, uh, further experimental characterization, including um, the testing in organic field effect transistors where physical or physical um, visual inspection of the molecule on the right, um, it was put on the shelf, okay? But because we have this database now, well, we've started to evaluate the packing configurations. They both pack in a very similar fashion, which we refer to as edge brickwork. So it's a little bit of a variation on that brickwork structure we've been talking about. But the key thing that we found because we have this computed data was that the electronic coupling that's important for whole carrier transport is about three times bigger for this molecule on the right than the molecule on the left. So we, we've got a comparison of 125 milli electron volts for the electronic coupling to 34. And this sparked interest in our synthetic colleagues because again, this system that's on the right here had been put aside because visually when they looked at that crystal structure, it just didn't look like it was gonna be a good material. These materials, these molecules were resynthesized, new semiconductors were made from them. And indeed, in experiments by Oren and Chichescu's group, again at Wake Forest, they've done a lot of field effect transistors to extract not only average mobilities, but maximum mobilities. And you can see that this material on the right outperforms that on the left um, by about a factor of two in terms of the extracted charge carrier mobilities. And so again, not only do you, can you use this data to you know, maybe just to um, discover new materials and define new paradigms, but you might also be able just to use it to find materials that didn't you know, pass some sort of initial evaluation when they were first created. And so with that, um, that's a little bit about Ocelot and this is where we plan to go. Um, those dotted lines are things that we're doing now, again, including looking at things like web crawling and crawling the literature i um, getting uh, contributions from the community, and then also going more towards data analytics and machine learning. So with that, I'm gonna come back to this question that I started with. I don't have an answer for it yet. Um, and that's what I think is really exciting about this field is that there's so much chemistry 
um, physics and material science that really needs to be solved um, for us to really to be able to answer this question. But you know, hopefully I've shown you that um, throughout this talk, right, that materials design and discovery, when we're thinking about these crystalline systems, right, um, we may need to consider more than just predicting that low energy structure. And I think in, in these particular materials, um, that can be used in a, in a wide variety of semiconducting-like applications. Um, having an idea of the, the final response of the material um, is going to be a key parameter to go into any design paradigm. Um, the chemical environment from which the materials are developed matters. And we, we've, we've shown that a little bit with some of the processing conditions. And of course, the interfaces that are in these processing paradigms are also important. Um, Data-driven approaches, I'm a big fan. I think we these are things that we absolutely need to do, but I can tell you in the field of organic semiconductors, we need more data. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to push here is the development of an open access and, and very well curated data set for the community. And then finally, um, I, I don't think we can fit, forget about intuition and creativity. Um, you know, we, we talk about machine learning and, and machine-aided design, but the human brain right, is, is, is incredibly powerful. And, and so, you know, we need to, to remember the, the creativity of the science, of the scientist um, as we move forward in terms of the development of these materials. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, again, a tremendous thank you to Professor Rafiq and Professor Aisha for the invitation. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Cherisco, for a very interesting talk. Um, yeah, there are so many information that we obtained from Dr. Cherisco this morning. So we need creativity and innovation, yeah, Chad, uh, in order to move uh, forward. And yeah, about the, the data, uh, you need a lot of data. You mean uh, we have to do experiments? Or what? We, uh, when you're talking about that data database, you know, to do the artificial intelligence. We hope what, so. What do you, yes, we, we hope need to do. do yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, audience, um, do you have any questions? Can post it to Dr. Risco. Okay, I, I'll start um, with one question. So in um, DFT, okay, DFT, because uh, we have um, in the structure, we have many, many atoms, many particles in our system. Uh, usually, how long does it take uh, to simulate uh, to simulate the model? Well, so it, it will depend on, on the size of the, well, the number of atoms in the unit cell, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so for... The, the tips pentacene, which has one molecule per unit cell, we can do pretty nice calculations in a few hours. Um, mm -hmm. But for go, which packs herringbone, um, we cannot. Um, it, it's, it's very big and it takes quite a long time for us to get information on it. Yeah, so um, because from our experience here that it takes a, a few few days uh, yeah, to get uh, to get the the results, and so that's uh, and also about this open. Uh, yeah, okay. I have one question there from mm -hmm. Li Yi Fong. Can you yeah. read it, Chad? Yeah. So, how is the research able to bring benefit to industry um, related to related to chemistry? So, um, you know, I think one of the things that we want to do as computational chemists, at least the computational chemists in our group, is that we're not just doing calculations for the sake of doing calculations. We, we want to be able to aid materials design um, and, and think about not just, oh, I can do a really great calculation on a single molecule, but I can take and do a lot of different kinds of calculations that might take that single molecule and understand how the material is formed and then how the material can be used. And that's where I think that we can bring benefit to industry, right? is to develop sort of this stream of information that follows this the, the, the technology stream, right? And, and by technology stream, I mean from that initial idea conception 
through the actual making of the material. Now, once we get to you know the large scale processing and, and development, um, we can't do a whole lot with that because we're interested in atoms still. Um, but there are, you know, we collaborate with people like Dr. Ganapatha Subramanian, who does um, continual models that are very relevant um, to, to industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we need uh, people from different backgrounds, like uh, you said, chemistry, uh, physics, mm -hmm. and also materials. Materials, from materials and, 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 and Dr. Ganapatha Subramanian, he's a mechanical engineer. Mm. Um, so he's he's very um, fluent in well fluent that might be the not great word but in complex fluid dynamics right and so he and I are interested in in how the solvent and the molecules interact with each other because he's mm -hmm. interested in, in, in developing continuum models for free energy to that are based on free energy surfaces. Yeah, you sure about that uh, simulation that has the nanoseconds? Uh, what software? What software is that? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're not quite there yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but but you have shown the 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 results mm -hmm. using uh using what? Molecular using... dynamics. Oh, so okay. Classical molecular dynamics. Um, and and that's using open source code. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the way to go in the future. Yeah. Yes. Open access. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> we, we tried. Yeah, we tried with the quantum espresso, yep. but it took us a very long time <laughs> yeah. to do that. <laughs> okay, yeah. there's one another question by Muhammad Anwar Hussein. Yeah. yeah, so what is the potential application of this research? So in terms of application, so at the beginning of the talk, we talked a little bit about some of the um, uh, sort of current applications. So, um, well, I've got my my Samsung phone here. On, that I'm showing you. Um, this is an example of an organic light emitting diode display. So this is an example of technology that's currently on the marketplace. Um, and, and there are of course televisions now from LG and Samsung that have that technology in them. Probably next is gonna be white lighting for, for rooms. Um, and then there's a lot of interest in, in solar cells as well. Um, I'd say probably for me, one of the more exciting applications though is in the field of bioelectronics. And, and there, we haven't done any research, but there people are taking advantage of the fact that these semiconductors are organic. And if you think about putting a sensor in the body, well, you're organic, hopefully, mostly. <laughs> so, thinking about the, the connections between you know, this, this, this man-made sensor and, and the human body, you know, because it's an organic, organic interface, um, people are seeing a lot better sensitivity for measurements in vivo, um, as well as um, less rejection, right, of the devices when they're when they're put in contact, like actually in the body. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's just towards the towards the medical uh, applications. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, right. Uh, so it was a very, very good and interesting talk. So for us here, Chad, we have some uh, problems with the resources. So yeah, we yeah. don't have the luxury of um, having the, all this very fast uh, software. So I think open access should be the, uh, the way forward. Yes. for us uh, to use this uh, technology. Yes. Um, yeah, so there are, I think there are no more questions. Okay. Um, I think uh, with that, um, I will end our, our talk, our session today. So it's been a very, very good uh, talk, very informative. And I like the way how you, uh, how you explain it yeah, is a, uh, very down okay. down to earth and um i mean people who are also not familiar can can understand what you what you talk about yeah okay, okay well, chat so uh -huh, stay safe um take care and yes uh, you you will you are welcome to utm whenever this COVID things goes uh, go away yeah <laughs> so <laughs> please do come and uh, visit us here and for the audience, yeah, if you want to ask any more uh, questions about the computational chemistry, I think Dr. Chad Risco will not mind um, 
receiving your uh, questions through to, through the email or you yep. can just uh, search search for him he's a very famous famous person <laughs> in computational Not chemistry fair. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And uh, indeed, if, if folks have questions, please feel free to send me an email. I, I'm happy to, to continue the conversation. Okay. Okay. All right, Chad. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.